in the late 1930s, America was still in the throes of the Great Depression. The stock market crash of 1929 had been followed by years of drought in America's heartland. The Dust Bowl wiped out entire family homesteads. Often with nothing more than the shirt on their back, these beleaguered refugees headed for the golden state of California, there to begin a new life. Against this backdrop of despair and hardship, Southern Pacific Railroad President Angus D. MacDonald made a bold move. Believing his company could help break the national recession by providing new jobs, he commissioned the design and manufacture of what broadcast commentator John B. Hughes would later call the most beautiful train in the world, the daylight. The motive power was built at the Lima Locomotive Works in Ohio. Each engine was cast out of a single piece of solid steel. The GS4 steam locomotives and tenders weighed in at over 870,000 pounds. That's 435 tons fully loaded. Coupled together, the engine and tender were slightly more than 110 feet long, 10 feet high, and 15 feet tall. The locomotive put out 78,000 pounds of tractive effort to the drive wheels and was manufactured at a cost of $175,000 each. The wheel arrangement was called a 484. It had four-wheel pilot trucks in front, eight main drive wheels in the center, and a four-wheel trailing truck behind the drivers. The 80-inch drive wheels virtually towered over Southern Pacific President Frank Russell Sr. in this 1950s photograph. These four GS2 class daylights were photographed shortly after their arrival in Los Angeles. Principally, the trains were intended for passenger service between San Francisco in the north and Los Angeles in the south. In later years, these engines also saw duty between Los Angeles and El Paso and occasionally on feeder lines. But it was the famous coast route between Frisco and LA that daylights were best known for running. From the engine to the parlor observation car, the daylight was painted in uncommonly bright colored stripes of orange, red, and black. They installed broad sweeping skirts along both sides of each engine to make them look long and sleek. The passenger cars were fabricated by the Pullman Coachworks in Chicago. From front to back, the daylights were streamlined wonders to behold. Let's get her going, men. We got five minutes. Five minutes. This was an era in history when nothing could stop us. If it was bigger, if it was better, it had to be made in America. In the 40s and 50s, traveling by train on Southern Pacific's daylights was a first cabin experience all the way. Opulent parlor observation cars with gracefully flowing fan tails replaced the boxy looking caboose. Inside were photo murals, carpets and drapes, porter call buttons, and chairs that swiveled in any direction. The $4.73 ticket fare between San Francisco and Los Angeles was mighty hard to beat, costing only a penny a mile. Imagine riding across the countryside in your reclining seat with porters serving your every whim. Many romances blossomed aboard the daylights, especially during World War II, when the daylight transported more GIs than any train in the country. Why, with so many miles of swaying seductively in your seat, gazing across the tavern car at a dashing young man in the opposite seat gave rise to many a torrid tale which is perhaps best left to memory and not retold here.
there was famous horseshoe curve. It was so sharp, passengers on the rear of the train could wave to those in the front. This was the terminal at San Luis Obispo and the main station in Santa Barbara. In those days, porters would stand and wait for the line to form at the San Francisco terminal. These were gentle times that most likely will never be recaptured in our generation. When gasoline was two bits, pinup girls were still in fashion, and daylights were the most beautiful trains in the world. But like all good stories, the daylight too had her ending. In 1958, the last engine made her final run. They took off the side skirts and pulled them onto sidings. Diesels had proven to be far more cost efficient to operate. They required only a third of the labor needed to run and service a steam engine, and fuel consumption was almost cut in half. Out of more than 50 daylight engines, only one GS4 locomotive was saved, designated as engine number 4449. It was donated to the city of Portland, Oregon, where it was put on display in Oaks Park, never to run again. 17 years later, it was America's 200th birthday, the Bicentennial. An engine was needed to pull the Freedom Train, so all eyes turned to the forlorn old steam engine in Oaks Park. Weather beaten and vandalized, it wasn't a very pretty sight. But after tremendous difficulty and a massive restoration effort with hundreds of volunteers, the 4449 was restored, refurbished, and painted red, white, and blue as America's Freedom Train in 1976. This was Portland, Oregon, 15 years later. Fishermen were out in their boats on the Willamette River, trying for the spring run of salmon. And Fred Meyer's new superstores were the hottest thing in town. Skyfire had been contracted by Southern Pacific Transportation Company to film the running of the daylight. Portland, Sacramento, California. We were directed to a dilapidated old roundhouse in the center of the rail yard. There to meet one Doyle McCormick, the engineer and chief mechanical officer in charge of the train. Walking around the corner, I couldn't believe my eyes. There she was, bright, polished, and far bigger than you ever would imagine. The roundhouse was full of activity. Over on the side, a grubby-looking character in dirty overalls was trying to bore a hole through the side of a rail car with a power grinder. Inquiring where I might find Mr. McCormick, the guy shot me one of these looks. Mm-hmm. I am Doyle McCormick, he flustered, and who the f are you? Well, it wasn't long before I met the rest of the crew. Pat Tracy on the chisel hammer, Dick Yeager, who was in charge of the food, and the old man, Big Jack Wheelahan. What a great name for a railroad man. They had the main rods off the engine to refurbish the bearings and cylinders. I asked Doyle McCormick how the running gear worked. Well, there's another rod that goes on here, and then there's another rod that goes here, then there's another rod that goes here. I mean, there's all kind of pieces to go on here yet. Yep, this was going to be an interesting shoot. Why, we hadn't been there five minutes before it started to rain. There's a little physical fact I like to, to describe about this locomotive. All of the parts on here that they're called combined reciprocating weight, which is the piston, the crosshead, portion of the main rod, weighs over 4,000 pounds. And at 80 miles an hour, that changes directions 11 times a second. So when you look out the window and you're going down the road... It's trying to tear itself apart. Yeah, these things go into the self-destruct mode as soon as you start to run them. I mean, they just fling themselves. On each wheel, of course, is a big counterweight that counteracts the centrifugal force of the rods on the other side of the wheel. And hopefully everything's in balance when you're going 80 miles an hour down the railroad. When he wasn't working on the daylight, 
Doyle was a regular engineer for Southern Pacific, and a good one too. Uh, it's a job that, that I like. Uh, I come from a railroad family. My grandfather was a railroader. My father was a railroader. I had two brothers in the railroad. The railroad just comes naturally to me. I inherited the love of the railroad from my dad. A lot of tradition, isn't yeah. there? A lot of tradition. A lot of tradition. Uh, you know, when I was growing up, like I say, my dad loved the railroad, and, and uh, I used to go with him when I was a kid when he went to work, and I liked hanging around the railroad, and it just was natural for me to be a railroader then. Doyle ran diesel freights on the Portland to Eugene division, and he had earned a certain irreverent reputation. Mr. McCormick's patience is inversely proportional to the length of time that he's been up. The longer he's up, the shorter his patience becomes. And, Say that. And it, 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 he approaches a raving maniac long about 9.30 in the evening, which I'm used to it, Jack's used to it, and so are most of the other guys. But he, he scared off several people because they really don't understand where he's coming from. And that's one of the things that makes this, this operation click is that we have been together so long that we understand each other and he can rant and rave and, and yell at you and all that and you just go ahead and you do the job the way it needs to be done and you just keep on going. I like to think that we're a little bit more well-rounded than some of the, the foamers I think that are into this hobby that all they know is railroads. They don't under recognize a good looking woman when they see her and they don't understand fine music, symphony music or bluegrass or jazz like Dick and I are into. Uh, Doyle likes country music, and I can get into some of that too. But you know, I think we're. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Not, no. no. Let me. Let me. No. Don't, no. don't confuse that. the words country and music. Oil and water. It was easy to see these daylight railroad boys were a real hand to draw to. The Skyfire technical crew, headed by Pat Maxfield put in a long week installing our miniature cameras on the engine. By the time we checked all the angles and fixed a broken wire or two, we had run over 4,000 feet of video and audio cable. How many people does it take to run a bandsaw? Five of us. Doyle and his crew helped us fabricate several special camera mounts so they couldn't be seen by the casual observer. We wanted to document the running, but we didn't want to spoil the view for thousands of rail fans that would be lining the right of way. We used eight broadcast recorders aboard the train, a helicopter, three chase cameras on the ground, and a roving camera aboard the train. We would burn up 92 hours of videotape stock. Audio was recorded digitally using Brad Miller's Colossus four-channel stereo recording systems. The crew affectionately called this grand endeavor the mother of all train shoots. As they lighted the boiler and warmed up the engine, cameraman Sam Breen and I each walked around the shops with our cameras, and this is what we saw. It's always a good feeling after you've pounded your head against that thing for weeks and weeks and weeks and you finally get to fire it up and then she starts to come alive, she warms up. It's, it's sort of like giving birth, I guess. When you start the system, since she really comes to life, her heartbeat starts and she starts to breathe. It's, it's, it's always fun. That's one of the most enjoyable parts about running is when you bring her from a cold piece of iron to a living creature. And that is the closest man has ever come to creating life. This country was built by the railroads, and everybody remembers that. And railroads are an easy thing to like. Everybody likes trains. They're nice to watch go by. I can remember it five years ago. We got the crew of the 4449 to take a short break and do a little reminiscing. It didn't cost anything. Money was tight in the war. And, uh, you know, you couldn't afford a Lionel train set, but you could stand by the tracks and watch the train go by. Well, you are old. The war? Yeah. 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 I can remember when the war was over. <laughs> That's the Vietnam War, right? No. Oh, the big war! The big war. WWII. 
I'm talking about people who chase trains. What's the funniest thing you've ever seen in people? Oh, yep, yep, yep. <laughs> right there is the funniest thing I've ever seen. <laughs> That's right. Down in Florida, 1977. Long time ago. <laughs> we were running a trip for Amtrak, and we tripped a hot box detector, and we stopped in the middle of miles of orange groves. Well, Dick liking oranges the way he does, he decides it's time to pick a few oranges. So over into the orange grove he goes. And he stands there by the tree and grabs his shirt and pulls it out. And he picks about four dozen oranges the size of his shirt. <laughs> so he inspected the train and we whistled off. I says to the fireman, I said, everybody up back there? And he turned to me and he had a real funny look on his face. He said, I think Dick's mooning the train. I said, what? <laughs> I went over to the other side of the cab and looked back, and here was Dick down in the ditch. He'd run for the train, and he went down to the ditch, and when he started up, his pants did. <laughs> There's Dick bent over, not wanting to drop the oranges, <laughs> trying to pull his pants up at the same time. And the whole train, the whole train is going, Ray! <laughs> It was a cold winter's evening, the guests were all leaving. O'Reilly was closing the bar. When he turned and he said to the lady in red, Get out, you can't stay where you are. Oh, she shed a sad tear in her bucket of beer as she thought of the cold nights ahead. When a gentleman dapper stepped out of the bathroom And these are the words that he said Oh, her mother never told her All the things a young girl should know About those daylight railroad boys And how they come and go mostly gold Oh, age had taken her beauty and sin had left its sad scar So remember your mothers and sisters, boys and let her sleep under the bar under the bar That's the last car. Go get the torch out of the roundhouse office. What are you looking for, George? This is going to turn into an all-nighter. I can see that. And then came the moment we'd all been waiting for. Doyle pulled the 4449 onto the turntable. There, they would rotate the engine and tender onto the proper track.
As the engine backed up, I remember thinking to myself that I had probably seen far prettier pictures than this, but at that very moment, I couldn't remember one. The next morning, the engine steam curled magically about the high landmark tower of Portland's Union Station. It was as if we were still in the 40s, waiting for the train to leave. All cameras were in place and functioning. I made a last-minute iris adjustment to compensate for the gray skies. Hopefully, the rain would hold off until we left town. Passengers were eager to board as they waited in the station. The train's crew were finishing up with the grease gun. Jack Wheelahan said a well-lubed engine was a happy engine. As spectators mingled about the majestic train, Doyle walked back to the crew car to check on the onboard generator. You could see it in their faces. All levity had been left behind at the roundhouse. This was train day, and Dick Yeager was all business. They lowered the steel railroad bridge over the Willamette River so the daylight could cross to the other side. Two sharp reports on the whistle was the signal we had waited for. Our long-awaited journey was about to begin. Still photographer Mike Carville had to make a run for it to catch the train. When Doyle McCormick said, we're leaving, that's exactly what he meant. We said goodbye to Portland and Union Station. Ahead lay miles of spectacular Oregon high country. For a younger generation who had never seen a steam engine pull out of the station, the daylight put on a fitting performance. Red gray skies and the black steel bridge trusses added to the feeling of mystery that each of us felt 
as if we were stepping back in time. Black smoke from the boiler lay heavy in the sky over Portland. Pat Tracy was our fireman. This particular morning, anyone within a half a mile of the track who was trying to catch some sleep would have to be mighty fast. As we passed down through the narrow corridors, the steam whistle changed in pitch and amplitude as it bounced off the buildings and the bridges. Judging by the height of the crossings, we have mounted this low angle camera none too high. Just ahead was Portland's Milwaukee district and Clackamas. As Doyle cracked open the throttle, the crew back in the tool car leaned out the open doors to listen to the beautiful sound of the exhaust. This train is the uh, old shaft of daylight equipment, and uh, with the steam engine, it's nostalgia at its best. Anywhere there's a train to go on, I'll, I'll take it. This train was put together, this locomotive, for the Centennial. And uh, volunteers came from all over the country, old steam engine employees with particular skills, and uh, got this running. It's fun to watch. You'll have a good time. <laughs> it's great. Rain clouds had been blown away, and warm sunlight streamed through the windows. There was something indescribably wonderful about riding this train. The clicking of the wheels on the rail, the gentle pitching of the cars had a hypnotic effect. Just around the bend was Oregon City, 
and the Willamette Falls. This spectacular natural waterfall was once a popular fishing spot for the native Indians who lived here. Geographically, we were traveling south along the banks of the Willamette River. But in railroad geography, we were actually traveling west. There were several cars pacing alongside of the train. <laughs> we called them the Rat Pack. Doyle McCormick was in constant communication with the Southern Pacific Dispatcher. Up and down the line, everyone knew the 4449 was running down the road. Here was a pure picture of contentment. Doyle pointed at the speedometer, and I tried to follow. It read 60, but the way the engine was shaking, it felt like 90. It was like riding out a hurricane inside a spam can. We were coming into the small town of Jefferson at the Marion County line. We crossed the Jefferson Bridge and then highballed it for Albany.
down the line in Albany, Oregon, passengers were waiting anxiously for the arrival of the daylight. We drifted across old Highway 99, Doyle laying on the whistle all the way. BLT, but hold the mail. The passengers boarded quickly as Doyle cleared the track. It was right about here that I started to get a little bit worried. Seems Doyle was going over a road map to find out where he was going. Looking out at those rails, it was real plain to me where we were going. Actually, those were the Daylight's train orders, written instructions for the train crew. They usually contained temporary slow orders, a speed restriction through a posted block of track that was under construction. We rolled across the Mackenzie River, famous for its upstream fishing in whitewater rapids. Junction City and Eugene lay just ahead. we approached the town of Eugene, Oregon, Doyle blew the 4449's Typhoon Air Horn, a warning device originally installed on the daylights to cut through California's dense coastal Thule fog banks.
sunlight glistening off the rails was a welcome reprieve from all the rain. Eugene was a service stop for the engine. Using a compressed air grease gun, they shot the bearings full of pin grease. I've always said these, these locomotives are like women, you know, they're, they're very beautiful and they're graceful. And that's why we call them she and her. But uh, they're also like a woman in that if you don't treat them right, They'll make you the sorriest sucker ever walk the face of this earth. Being around this thing's like being married to a second woman, too. You know? It's like having two wives. They both demand an awful lot of your time. I may look old, but I'd be young at heart. <laughs> I may look young, but I'm old at heart. <laughs> Meanwhile, I transferred to the helicopter and flew out in front of the engine to set up our next series of shots. We left Eugene on schedule and pointed the nose toward the distant Cascades. Our next schedule stop was to be at Oak Ridge, Oregon. Now here's something that provided the video crew back at the tool car a little bit of amusement. As we left Eugene, seems this big old fly decided to hitch a ride with the daylight. Unfortunately, he did it right on the face of our camera lens. He held on for dear life a good 12 miles before finally jumping ship somewhere around a place called Dexter. A freight consist was holding on the north side of the Willamette River trestle. This was the first of three high steel river trestles that would traverse the Willamette River. Doyle explained to us the difference between a bridge and a trestle. A bridge is a crossing structure just as we know a bridge to be. But a trestle is a crossing device with an overhead steel support structure, just like a covered bridge. As I listen for the whistle, lie awake and wait. Wish the railroad didn't run so near. As the rattle and the clatter of that old fast freight keeps a making music in my ear. Go bum again. Go bum again. Well, if you go, you can't come back. If you go, you can't come back. If you go, you can't come back. Well, if you go, you can't come back. If you go, you can't come back. I wouldn't give a nickel for the bum I used to be. Worked as hard as any man in town. I've got a pretty girl, she thinks the world of me. A man would be a fool to turn her down. No. Every night I listen, wonder if it's late. In my dreams I'm riding on that train. I feel my pulse of beating with that old fast freight. And thank the Lord, I'm just a bum again. Go bum again. Let's go. 
If you go, you can't come back. If you go, you can't come back. Well, if you go, you can't come back. If you go, you can't come back. Pat Tracy put some magic sand in the boiler to clear the flues as the daylight headed for Lookout Reservoir. We had left behind the lush green fields in the valley and were starting our climb into the high country. It was just one of those lazy afternoons with nothing but miles of open country. Suddenly, we broke out of the forest and crossed Highway 58. There were still several cars following the train, including our cameraman, Rob Jackamick, who got these great tracking shots.
daylight, and her 11-car consist climbed up the mountainside along the North Fork of the Willamette River. The engine had hit a series of yellow caution signals and had lost its momentum on the steep grade. Up ahead, a downhill Amtrak train was holding on the main line. But now came the first of what would be 23 hard rock tunnels between here and the top of the grade at Cascade Summit. When we came out the other side, watch how the steam rolled off the top of the tunnel ceiling. The block signals, which are traffic control lights for trains, was lighted yellow. The daylight was switched into the hole on a siding, so the downhill Amtrak could pass by on the high iron. We were climbing through a tall stand of Douglas fir as the daylight's exhaust erupted into volcano-sized clouds of vapor. We came out of the cut and approached the rural logging camp of West Fir, Oregon. In the center of town was this beautiful old covered bridge. This was to be our final crossing of the Willamette River. Then came the West Fur Tunnel. On the other side would be the town of Oak Ridge. As the daylight pulled into Oak Ridge, Oregon, there were people all along the trackside. Not just the older generation who remembered steam locomotives, but children too. It was remarkable, in this age of lasers, computers, and high-tech wizardry, that a steam engine built in 1938 would bring out so many people to watch her huff and chuff her way proudly into the center of town and into the hearts of those who came to welcome her. In preparation for the steep climb up the snow-capped Cascades, the Southern Pacific Railroad had elected to bring in two new helper diesels to pull the daylight over the mountain. We arranged to have Pat Maxfield step across onto the helpers with a miniature finger cam to get some unique shots of the daylight. Snubbed up tight for the trip over the mountain, the helpers left Oak Ridge with the daylight in tow.
as the helicopter flew up the canyon, pilot John Kelly spotted a herd of wild elk on a skid road below the track. Between the sound of the train and the helicopter overhead, the elk quickly decided to hightail it for safer ground. The canyons were extremely rugged in this country, but absolutely breathtaking. What had fallen as rain in Portland the night before had turned to snow in the foothills, and we had only begun to climb. The daylight glided up the narrow roadbed toward the Salt Creek Bridge. Rail fans with cameras were ready for the spectacle. This was majestic Salt Creek Falls. After watching those two photo run-bys, I'm hooked. I do not want to get off at Klamath Falls. I want to go on to Sacramento. We wouldn't have missed this for anything in the world because I keep thinking it might be the last trip that it might make over this line. And it's just old 44-49 that's got me out here, I'll tell you that. We found seven of these railroad ties, um, four of them to make a picture frame to put the picture of the run through in, and the rest just to give to my friends and keep for myself. You didn't smash any of those coins, did you? Oh uh, yeah, about a bunch of them. <laughs> got quarter, we got quor quarters and we got all of them. Dimes and pennies and... Stuff. The, the best trip we've ever had. Uh, it, uh, it, it's something that will never be able to be reproduced. Well, my uh, earliest memory, I was probably about four, was uh, riding a train behind a steam locomotive from uh, Banks to Vernonia, Oregon. Oh, this is the best train trip in the world. <laughs> Beautiful weather, smooth ride, gracious lounge chairs to sit in. Who could ask for anything more? It's been a tremendous experience seeing the different scenery. There's nothing quite like what we've been through today in Australia. My father-in-law Lee grew up in the Siletz River country and they did a lot of steam logging and all I can ever remember him talking about for the last 10 years was steam engines and steam locomotives. Uh, he knows where just about every Shea locomotive, which are the old logging locomotives, are around. Yeah, just about all. It's really exciting, the engine and the smoke and the sound and the horn and all the smells and the snow and the trees and everything. It's fantastic. We had exceeded the snow line of the Pacific Cascades. Though it was April, the outside temperature was a chilly 26 degrees. shelter of a giant cedar tree, a group of black-tailed deer watched our processional trudge by with little more than passive interest. We had started to clear through a series of black rock tunnels which had been chiseled into the mountain's basalt face. tracks of steel 
were cantilevered over treacherous, gaping ravines. Rumors were whispered of entire rail cars that pitched over the side into fathomless dark chasms during the great 64 flood at Noisy Creek. We were intruders in a frozen, windswept no man's land of rock, ice, and snow. The only thing between fate and eternity were the steel wheel flanges that held tightly to the track. As we neared the top of Willamette Pass, fireman Jack Wheelahan stoked up the boiler. Soon the daylight would be back on our own. Cascade Summit, the top of the world in these parts. The diesels pushed on ahead of the daylight for Klamath Falls. They would meet again tomorrow at the base of Mount Shasta. Clouds of steam drifted along the treetops as the daylight made her way along the shores of Odell Lake. The lake was a picture of frozen silence, only the sound of melting snow.
The daylight left Crescent Lake and turned south for Klamath Falls. This was the high desert country of eastern Oregon. Tall jack pine trees grew amid miles and miles of open meadowlands. Favorite habitat for wily herds of antelope. Tremendous heat from the engine steam cylinders and boiler set off the railroad's computerized hot box axle detectors all the way down the line. SP detector, milepost 390.9. Stop your train. Stop your train. First, hot box, axle 6. On left side. Second, hot box, axle 6. On right side. SD detector, milepost 390.951 miles per hour. Stop your train. Stop your train. Two defects. straight as a barrel stay into the Klamath Indian Reservation at Chiloquin. The locomotive generated so much vibration that the protective filter over the finger camera blew off. Actually made the picture look better now, didn't it? The daylight drifted downhill through the Klamath Indian Reservation. Lone jack pines stood sentinel over deep water canyons and colorful formations of sandstone. Chiloquin, 
the daylight went into a siding to allow the passage of a long old northbound freight train. Then she came out of the hole like thunder. We crossed over onto the east bank of the Williamson River. It was a downhill run to Klamath Lake from here, so Doyle let the giant engine drift lazily along in the afternoon sun. This train I ever did ride ran around Joe Brown's coal mine. The headlights come by about six o'clock. The boots come by about nine. The guys back in the crew car were keeping their chairs warm, telling wild stories and real bad jokes. <laughs> Who's gonna shoe your pretty little feet? Who's gonna glove your hand? Who's gonna kiss your red ruby lips and who's gonna be your man? Your papa gonna shoe your pretty little feet. Mama gonna glove your hand. Sister gonna kiss your red ruby lips and I'm gonna be your man. And then the 4449 broke onto the shoreline of Great Klamath Lake. We had left the reins of Portland traveled through the grassy bottomlands of the Willamette Valley, then climbed up to the very crest of the snowy Cascades. And now as we watched the setting sun, we marveled at the ground we'd covered in just a single day. Well, the longest train I ever did ride ran around Joe Brown's coal mine. The headlights come by about six o'clock, caboose come by about nine. Next morning, we waited as a northbound Amtrak made a station stop at Klamath. This was the end of the line for one crew and the start for another. There was a little old and a little new that morning, the daylight and the Amtrak. The old station cart and a John Deere garden tractor. Yeah, a lot had changed on this railroad. The northbound pulled out of town. Ahead for them lay the same set of tracks we had just crossed the day before. And now with a clear open track, the daylight came to life. The engine cylinder cocks were wide open, so the steam could carry out the condensated water from inside the piston chambers. The daylight pumped cubic clouds of snow-white vapor into the cold morning sky. And then, with all the skill of a picture car driver, Doyle pulled the entire train into a perfect three-quarter angle, right on the marks. Soon we were underway again, heading geographically south across a flat desert plain for the far distant snowy white peak of Mount Shasta.
we landed the helicopter on the far side of Warden Flats. One mile ahead, Sam Green had climbed down through a garbage dump to keep watch on a very remote tunnel, known only to locals, God himself, and of course the railroad. From here, the daylight train crossed into California, her home territory. Just around the bend was the Doris Tunnel. beginning to ascend to the base of Mount Shasta. The flatlands gave way to scrub pine and high desert sage. We had arranged to have the train make a special stop at the block signal just prior to Keg Pit. What we didn't know was that this section of winding uphill track had been installed with self-oilers to lubricate passing train wheels on the sharp turning tracks.
the grade grows sharply as we climb toward Grass Lake. These old buildings, seemingly lifeless in their silent repose, were all that remained of a place called Bray. We cruised along in the shadows of Grass Lake before heading downhill for Andesite and Black Butte. Just above the town of Weed, California, the daylight navigated across the high steel Hotland Bridge. This was Black Butte, 
a great crowd of photographers were awaiting the daylight's arrival. It all had a feeling of festiveness. Children were busy placing lucky pennies on the rail, and the railroad inspectors were busy shooing them off. The water tower was full, so all that was needed was a rousing good arrival. The daylight would again be coupled to a pair of helper diesels to take it down over the precipitous Cantera Loop into the Sacramento River Canyon. The tenders were replenished with water from this old-fashioned fill pipe, once used as standard equipment when the Southern Pacific was an all-steam-powered railroad. Soon, we were back on the road, sliding by the Black Butte cinder cone. Above towered the lofty, windswept peaks of Mount Shasta. This volcanic giant was one of several dormant volcanoes along the Pacific Ring of Fire. And then the daylight, with the two diesel helpers, started down into one of the most treacherous pieces of roadbed. This was the top of the Cantera Loop. Hundreds of feet below the track lay the Sacramento River. The roadbed clung precariously to the side of the mountain buttressed from underneath by steel and concrete. At treetop level, we followed the train from the air down into this narrow high mountain canyon. Over the side, grim reminders that this was a very serious grade. The narrow ribbons of steel descended even deeper into the ravine. At the bottom of the loop, we crossed over the Sacramento, a river we would follow all the way to Shasta Lake Reservoir. The train pulled into Dunsmere, where the crew serviced the engine. It was an affair that seemingly turned out the entire town. While they serviced the engine, aerial spotter Phil Carville and I took a side trip up the mountain to look at a sharp outthrust of granite rock known as Castle Craigs. This was the Trinity Alps country of the legendary creature known as Bigfoot. And 
then we continued our journey down the canyon. At a place called Lakehead, they cut the diesels loose. Watch on the right as the airline breaks connection. And then Doyle hauled back on the throttle, like he meant to win a tug-of-war game. And away we went. Then came the granddaddy of all crossings on this line, the Redding Bridge, over a mile of steel across the Sacramento River. The sun was low in the west as the daylight pulled into the station at the California Rail Museum in Sacramento. There was no question, we were in daylight country. People gathered to look up at this beautiful masterpiece of mechanical engineering. Fathers took sons in hand to tell them of this great steam locomotive. The daylight was truly one of a kind. After two weeks on display at Sacramento's 10-year rail fair exhibition, the daylight turned her Mars light northward for the return trip to Portland, Oregon. It had been a thrill of a lifetime to follow the daylight and her crew. The entire Skyfire team had formed a close bond with these railroad men. Now we felt a certain sadness as we closed the final chapter of this story. Sing it soft and low Sing it for you, baby And then I'll have to go Out where them chilly winds don't blow Wish I was a headlight On a westbound train I'd shine my light out Cool Colorado rain Out where them chilly winds don't blow If you're feeling lonely If you're feeling low Remember that I loved you more than you'll ever know 
Going where them chilly winds don't blow I'm leaving in the springtime Won't be back till fall I can't forget you I might not come back at all Out where them chilly winds don't blow Out where them chilly winds don't blow Out where them chilly winds don't blow If you would like more information on the daylight trains, you may wish to read a book entitled Southern Pacific Daylights, Volume 1, authored by Richard K. Wright. While you can't buy this book in stores, limited copies can be obtained by writing Richard Wright at 2285 Kapuro Way, Sparks, Nevada, 89431. Every year, the daylight makes scheduled excursion runs to various points in the United States. There's always seating available, and the ticket price is most affordable. If you would like to ride the daylight, you may write to Daylight Excursions at this address. A portion of proceeds from this program's purchase price has been donated to help restore and maintain the 4449 Daylight Engine and Train. I'm Jim Mitchell. Thank you for watching. <laughs>